वेलकम आई एम विशाल असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इलेक्ट्रिकल एंड इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स इंजीनियरिंग गवर्नमेंट इंजीनियरिंग कॉलेज बाटन हिल ट्रिवेंड्रम इन केरला सो इन दिस सीरीज ऑफ लेक्चर्स आई विल बी डिस्कसिंग दि बेसिक्स ऑफ डीसी डीसी कन्वेटर्स स्पेसीफिकली नॉन ऐसोलेट डीसी डीसी कन्वेटर्स देन वी विल गो ऑन टू पॉपुलर डीसी डीसी कन्वर्टर्स सच एस बक कन्वर्टर बूस्ट कन्वर्टर bug boost converter chuck converter and once all these converters are analyzed in continuous conduction mode then we will move on to the analysis on discontinuous conduction mode okay which is fairly complex compared to the continuous conduction mode of analysis then once that is completed then we will move on to isolated dc dc converters uh, which is popularly used or and extensively used in power supply applications so let's get started so the outcome of this lecture uh, rather the series of lectures is something like this so once you complete the course then not the course once you complete the lecture then you will be able to describe the salient features of a dc dc converter then you will be able to derive the voltage gain of dc dc converter and you will be able to evaluate the effect of non idealities that is uh, in deriving the voltage gain we have we will make some assumptions then we will come back and revisit these assumptions with a more genuine and practical sense rather we will take into effect of these non idealities which were ignored in calculating the voltage gain of the dc dc converter and we will see how these non idealities will affect the performance of the dc dc converter so uh, in this introductory lecture we will start with basics of dc dc converters and then we will move on to the most basic buck converter and once the lecture is completed then we will try to do a few example questions on buck converter specifically design of buck converter so let's get started into the content so why do we need a dc dc converter that is we have a source which is usually a dc converter dc source battery usually battery or maybe a rectified dc and we have a load it may be a resistor or it may be a dc motor or any load which can take dc now why can't we connect them directly uh, and why do we need a dc dc converter in between them and the reason is that the voltage incompatibility between these two for example if the input voltage source voltage is vs and the load voltage what is required is v0 and if v vs is not equal to v0 then we will not be able to connect them directly okay so that is the reason why we we would like to have a dc dc converter and a dc dc converter sits in between these two and it accepts voltage at a level vs and gives out voltage at a level compatible with the load thus we can say the gain of this dc dc converter is v0 by vs or vo by vs so the purpose of a dc dc converter is to make the two voltages which are otherwise different compatible with each other and in addition over and above that a dc dc the modern dc dc converters can do several other aspects several and it can bring in several other power quality improvements and stuff like that which we will discuss as we move along this lecture so in the most basic sense if the if the load and the source are incompatible then we can have a dc dc converter in between to make them compatible secondly most probably the source would be a fixed source like a rectified uh, diode controlled rectifier or or diode rectifier or a battery as such where usually the voltage is fixed and the load might need variable voltage as in case of a dc motor for speed control even in such cases we will we can use dc dc converters which can generate variable output from a fixed input dc supply so all these are applications of dc dc converters now let's get into more details see now the issue we have is that we have an input voltage let's for simplicity sake let's assume that the source voltage is more than the load voltage we need a lesser voltage than the available source voltage 
So, the, what is the easiest thing we normally do in such conditions? That is, we will dissipate the extra voltage in a series dissipative element. The scenario is something like this. We have a source voltage like this and we can have a series resistance. Let it be RSC and we have your load and the voltage across the load is less than source voltage. If that is the case, if I is the current flowing through the circuit, we can design such that how much ever is the surplus voltage that is the load needs some voltage higher than the source voltage. So, the balance should be dropped balance should uh, sorry uh, this is dropped in that is Vs minus V0 is equal to I into RSE. It is dropped across the series resistance RSE. For example, if it is 10 volt and if it is 6 volt, I can choose a val uh, value of resistance RSC such that this current multiplied by this resistance is equal to 4 volt. So, if we know I, I can choose RSC. So, it is a series dissipation kind of thing. Similar is the case we have, we can have a transistor that is Instead of resistor, we can have a transistor as well. This is the source voltage and this is the desired load voltage and this is the collector to emitter voltage and by controlling the base current, I will be able to control the drop across the VCE terminals. So, even if the source voltage changes or the load voltage changes, I will be able to control the or regulate the output voltage as required. Same thing can be done here if I have a variable resistance instead of a fixed resistance. I can modulate this value of this resistance to changing load demands so that the output voltage is maintained at 6 volt. Same can be done by modulating IB base current. Then the voltage across the collector emitter terminals will vary and we can keep V0 regulated at its desired value. These are pretty simple. And in fact, the lab power supplies, what you are familiar, that heavy bulky things, what you would be seeing in your lab are made with this kind of linear regulators. These are called linear regulators. What is the drawback of this system? Simplicity is an advantage. And what is the drawback? There is one major advantage. I will tell it later. What is the drawback of this scenario or this scheme? What is the efficiency of this system? Output power by input power. And what is output power? That is output voltage into current, which is common for all these things. It is a series circuit. So, the same current flows through the source, through the series dissipative element as well as the load. Similarly, what is input? Input voltage into current supplied by the input or it will become V0 by Vn. Now, the issue is that as the output voltage falls, efficiency also falls, which means at very low output voltages, for example, if it is 10 volt and if it is only 1 volt, then the efficiency is as poor as 10 percentage and efficiency drops as the output voltage falls. Such schemes, linear regulators will have a reasonably good efficiency if and only if the input voltage and the output voltage are more or less close to each other. If there is a wide difference, then that much power will get dissipated across the series dissipative element, transistor in this case or resistor in this case and that is based as heat. And it is because of this reason, these transistors are mounted on heavy heat sinks and that is the reason why your lab power supplies are usually very heavy. Okay. So, it is a highly dissipative, efficiency is usually poor and this is not what we would require otherwise. Now, comes the third one switched mode power conversion and remember this is non dissipative in ideal sense it is non dissipative why is it so that is what we are going to discuss next now for linear, linear regulators which we have discussed in the previous slide we will come back to that now what we have is that instead of a series dissipative element we have a switch a semiconductor switch which can be turned on or turned off 
at our will and it can be it will at, at a very fast pace it can be turned on and turned off and several times maybe several thousand times in a second and now what we do is that we keep the switch closed for some amount of time let it be dts where ts is the switching time switching type d is called the duty ratio that is the duration for which the switch is on compared to the total duration this is nothing but t on by ts this is called duty ratio so this is uh, we can see it will be less than 1 it will be between 0 and 1 so what is t on you multiply t on it becomes d into ts that's what is being shown the switch is on for a period d into ts d is less than 1 now what happens the switch remains closed then the source is connected directly across the load now this is the output voltage. Output voltage is plotted along the y axis and time is along the x axis. Now, what, what do you expect or what, what are you getting? When the switch is on, the entire source voltage comes across the load. So, that is being marked as B for a duration DTS. After that, I open the switch and I will keep it open for a duration 1 minus DTS. 1 minus D into TS. DTS is the on time. So, naturally, 1 minus DTS would be the off time. So, you, if you sum it up, you will get one switching cycle TS. So, for the remaining portion from DTS to TS, the switch is off. Switch is off means the load and the source are isolated from each other. Naturally, the voltage across the load resistor would be zero. That is being marked here. The voltage is zero. So, for, for a duration DTS, it is output voltage is equal to input voltage. And for the duration 1 minus D into TS, this much, 1 minus D into TS, the output voltage is 0. Now the, now, the catch is that if you can take the average voltage, V0 average, what would you get? You can take the average of this one. Let, let me do it. 1 by period. What is the voltage when it is on? It is the source voltage V itself into the duration is DTS. V into DTS plus when it is off, it is 0 into 1 minus D TS. Now, this can be cancelled because it is 0. You get D into V or rather output voltage is equal to duty ratio multiplied by input voltage. Now, what is the meaning of this? By modulating D, I can get any value between 0 to V. Correspondingly, D will be 0 to 1. This is the variation of D and this is the variation of output voltage. Uh, so, this may be new to you or for absolute pressures, this may be new, but we are not getting a, uh, see, for a linear regulator, the output voltage was, how, how was the pattern? This was the output voltage, it was steady voltage, absolutely steady voltage. But here we have large amount of ripples. It is either V or 0. It is either V or 0. But the average voltage, we get whatever we want. If it is 6 volt, we want from 10 volt, it is just make duty, duty ratio is equal to 0 0.6. Just you have to do this much. Then the average output voltage will be key, will be 6 volt. That is what we want. Hope the concept is clear. This is how switching regulators work. And what is the main advantage of the switching regulator? Let me erase some portion of this. What was the drawback of uh, linear regulators? That was that the efficiency was extremely poor. Now here, what is the efficiency? Or what is the losses in the switch? Losses in the series element. It was. It is not dissipative here. We are assuming ideal switch. P loss is nothing but what is the let us let me take it as two stages on and off. What is the loss when it is on? When it is on, current flows. Yes, there is some amount of current, but what is the voltage when the switch is closed? When the switch is closed, the voltage across the switch when the switch is closed is zero. And when it is off, what is the voltage it is blocking? 
the entire source voltage is blocked across the switch. So, the switch blocks, blocks the voltage, the input voltage is blocked across the switch. But what is the current flow through the switch? Since the switch is open and being an ideal switch, there is no current flow. The contact is open, there is no current flow. So, current becomes zero. So, earlier when the switch is on, some amount of current is flowing, but the voltage across the switch becomes zero. And the dual happens when the switch is open. It, it blocks huge voltage or in fact the input voltage, entire input voltage is blocked by the switch. But the current flow through that is zero when it is blocking. So, the loss across the switch or the series element becomes zero, whereas it was not so in the case of linear regulators. So, when this when the switch is not dissipating any power, what is the efficiency? It is close to 1. Being If you consider ideal switches, ideal switches and all the elements as ideal, then the efficiency is 100 percent. But we know switch is not ideal switch. It has some amount of losses, but these are usually negligible in real life scenarios. So, efficiency is pretty high, very high and this is the main advantage of using switched mode power conversion. And one more thing is to remember, uh, the one of the advantage of linear regulators is, is simplicity, I, I have told that. You just have to have a transistor and a system to regulate the base current. Here you have to have a MOSFET or an IGBT, then you will have to have its own driver, then its own regulation uh, control circuits. So, it is fairly more complex, but then efficiency is very, very high. And, and it does not need heavy heat sinks like case of a linear regulator and hence most of the switched mode power converter, converter based DC DC converters are very compact and they are lightweight. Your mobile chargers, laptop chargers etc. operates in switched mode power conversion mode and that is why they are so lightweight and so compact compared to your lab power supplies. Okay. And one of the drawback of uh, this one is that this kind of a heavy voltage ripple. The ripple voltage itself becomes the input voltage itself. Such a large ripple, 100 percent ripple in output voltage. So, this is something which we, uh, which, which, which can be considered as a drawback of SMBS. But then we can use filters to reduce the ripple. But ripple will be there. Technically, ripple will be there, how much ever filtering we do. Whereas, linear regulators does not have this issue of ripple. So, for uh, applications such as servo motors which require absolutely steady DC supply, then you have to go for linear, linear regulators. For, uh, for most of the other applications which can afford a little amount of ripple in current and voltage, then you can go for switch mode power conversion. So, for servo applications, efficiency is not a concern, performance is. Whereas, for most of the other applications, performance is not a concern, we are mothered about efficiency. I hope uh, you understood the concept of switch mode power conversion and what is the advantages of that. Now, let us discuss the basic building block of a DC DC converter. I think you are familiar with what is being shown in this one. This is a SPDT switch, SPDT switch. So, we have only one pole that is why it is called single pole and we have double throw. We have two throws T1 and T2. So, it is a SPDT switch. One pole it can get connected to either T1 or pole can get connected to T2, okay, the familiar SPDT switch. Now, let us we will we will check how we will be able to make a DC DC converter from this kind of a switch. Now, what are the components of a DC DC converter? The main component we have just discussed it is a switch. See, it does not store energy, neither dissipates energy. This statement is not absolutely true real switches do dissipate energy, but then the energy dissipated is significantly less compared to the power it handles or the energy it handles. So, in that sense, we can for simplicity sake, we can assume it is an ideal switch. So, it does not store energy, neither does it dissipate energy. Okay. Now, then we have the sources. It is either voltage or current source from which power will be taken and transferred to the load. Then, a DC DC converter will have non dissipative storage element. This is important. It should not be a dissipative element. It should be non dissipative. What is the problem with dissipative element? We have seen in linear regulators, the efficiency will be poor. So, we will not, we will as far as possible, we will not be using any dissipative elements for the design of power electronic circuits. 
especially for DC DC converter. So, what are these non dissipative storage elements? It is the famous inductor and the capacitor. How does inductor store energy? An energy of half Li square, where I is the current flowing through the inductor, is stored in the magnetic field. Magnetic field of the inductor. Similarly, an energy equivalent of half Cv square. V is the voltage across the capacitor is stored in the electric field of the capacitor. So, these are non dissipative, they will not dissipate energy. So, they can be safely used in power electronic applications. Then, usually, the load which absorbs the energy from the source, usually, it will be usually a resistor or a DC motor for DC DC converter applications. Since our output is DC, it most probably it will be a resistor. So, these are the components of a DC DC converter. So, using all this, how can we make a converter which can solve the issue of voltage incompatibility between input and output? That is what we are going to see. Can we connect the switch and the sources and the load as the way we want? Actually, that is not that is not so. There are definitely some rules to be followed. And what are these rules? The connection rules are stated below. Sources should, actually I have made a spelling mistake. Sources should not be overloaded. Sources should not be overloaded. Which means a voltage source cannot be short circuited. It should not be short circuited. Similarly, a current source cannot be open circuited. The duality of that voltage source cannot be short circuited. The dual is that current source cannot be open circuited. Okay. Going in that lines, a capacitor voltage should not be short circuited. Charged capacitor acts like a voltage source, and inductor currents, which is analogous to a current source, inductor current should not be open circuited. Okay, this is based on the conservation of energy principle. Conservation of energy. For example, half Cv square is the energy stored in the capacitor. Once you short circuit, what happens? The voltage becomes equal to 0. The energy abruptly becomes 0. Some amount of energy was stored earlier. Once you short circuit the capacitor, it becomes 0. So, whereas the energy lost? This is plain, plain violation of the principle of conservation of energy. So, this is not, this should not be allowed in our circuit. We cannot short circuit a voltage source and similarly we cannot open circuit a current source. Same way half Li square is the energy stored in the inductor. Some energy is there once I open circuit a current source I become 0. So, the energy becomes instantaneously 0 because I is 0. So, some energy for example 10 joules immediately it should become 0. Now, that is a violation of conservation of energy. So, this these uh, principles we must keep in mind while we are connecting. Yes, now let us discuss the actual rules for connection. We have a pole, we have throw 1, throw 2. This is the SPDT switch we are talking about. A voltage source between PT1 or P2. Okay, let us see. We have a voltage source. Now, what if what happens if I connect P and T1? Pole and T1 is connected, then you are short circuiting a voltage source which is a violation of the rules what we have discussed so far. A voltage source cannot be connected between PT1. Same happens with PT2. If the throw is connected to T2, pole is connected to T2 and if you have a capacitor here, charged capacitor here, which acts as a voltage source, that also gets short circuited. So, you cannot connect, connect capacitors also between PT1 or PT2. Okay. So, you are forbidden to connect a, a voltage source a battery or a source or a charged capacitor across P and T1, across P and T1 or P and T2. This is forbidden, this you cannot do that. Similarly, current sources cannot be connected across T1 and T2. Okay, let us draw it again. This is T1, T2. You have a current source, current source, and this is the pole. Now, what happens when you connect T, uh, current source between T1 and T2? This current source will always be interrupted. It always be, because it is does not, see, you may say that it may 
flow through P, but then how does it come back to the same circuit? It does not come back. There is no return path for the current to flow. The moment you connect between T1 and T2, you are opening a current source. That is forbidden. So, this is also not allowed. This is also not allowed. Same way, we cannot connect an inductor also across T1 and T2. Because a current through the inductor is regarded as a current source, your inductive currents should not be opened. And if you connect between T1 and T2, you are opening an inductive current. So, that is also not allowed. So, we have discussed 1, 2, 3 and 4. So, then what can be done? What can be done is that you have T1, T1, you have T2 here, you have P here, the pole here, and you can, if, it, if needed, you can connect an inductor or a current source in series with P. Now, what happens when P is connected to T2? current can flow like this. When it is connected to T1, current can flow like this. So, current is never interrupted. An inductive current or a current source is never interrupted if you connect it in series with P. Because P is always connected either to T1 or to T2, which means the, the current source is always connected to one of these terminals. There is no point, there is no situation where the source gets open circuited. So, the current source is never getting open circuited. So, this is a valid connection scheme. Hope you understood. So, thus we have two valid connections, an inductor connected in series with pole. This need not be an inductor alone, it could be a current source as well, a current source also. Inductor or a current source can be connected in series with the pole. Similarly, a capacitor or a voltage source or a voltage source can be connected between T1 and T2. So, if you connect between T1 and T2, this never gets open circuited. Uh, sorry, I am sorry, it never gets short circuited. P is connected to T1 or P is connected to T2. T1 and T2 are never connected, which means this voltage source is never subjected to a short circuit. So, this is a valid connection. This is also a valid connection. So, this is the only two schemes in which we can connect sources and so, uh, kind of sources, switches and inductor and capacitor. Okay. With these connection rules, let us move forward. If you follow this, you have a source, you have a load, you have a switch which is marked by symbol S, you have inductor and capacitor. If you have one of them each, then we following the rules, we get three basic combinations, three basic topologies. If you uh, try, you will get, you will, you can narrow down into basically these three configurations only, okay. These are the only three configurations using SPDT switch, L, C, load and source. The first one is the buck converter. The second one is the boost converter. And the third one is the buck boost converter you have not learned this maybe. So, let us not worry about that. But understand, if you follow the connection rules, you get only three configurations, three, three topologies and which are shown in the figure. And first one is called the buck converter, second is the boost converter and the third is the buck boost. If you see, a voltage source is connected between T1 and T2, which is a valid combination. An inductor is connected in series with P, again a valid combination. Same happens here an inductor is connected in series with pole and between T1 and T2, between T1 and T2, you have a voltage source which is the output voltage. Same happens here. Inductor is connected in series with the board. T1 has a voltage source, T2 has another voltage source. This is the input voltage and this is the output voltage. By following these connection rules, we get three topologies and what that is being shown here. Now, we will focus our discussion exclusively on this buck converter. Now, we have not gone to a real circuit. We are still using the representation of a SPDT switch. In uh, shortly, we will see how we can realize this SPDT switch using practically or in commercially available components.